our study. This will conclude the spring quarter, and uh, Brother Warren will <clears throat> take over next week, begin a new study, and I will move over and uh, teach the uh, young adults for the summer. And then when we come back, uh, I don't know what we'll do next, but I've still got about five or six parables. I could do 10 or 12 more, but I've got about five or six, which I really hate not to cover. And although I hate to split it up like this, we may very well uh, finish those uh, in September before we move on to something else. Let's go back to Luke 16, and I guess uh, since it's been since last week, we'll, we'll reread the text. Uh, really there, the context goes through verse 13. He also said to his disciples, um, I'm not sure the King James or American Standard may use the word conjunctive and, but you'll notice that in some way it is... Um, uh, connected with um, the parable of what? What's in Luke 15? Or the end of Luke 15? Yeah, the prodigal son, right. So in some way there's a connection there, um, and perhaps we'll see that. Uh, but there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting or squandering his goods. So he's obviously not a very good steward. And so he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm not up to manual labor. Uh, and I'm ashamed to beg. Well, I guess good for you, but you weren't ashamed to be wasteful, were you? I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So you know, I'll just make sure that I, I get some people kind of uh, in my debt, owing me something, owing me a favor, and then they'll take care of me. Um, so he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. Um, that is about um, 800 gallons, 800 to 1,000 gallons of oil, the yield of about 146 olive trees, and worth about a thousand denarii um, or 170 bucks. And of course, the denarius was a day's wage, so, so pretty good amount of money there. And um, so he said, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. Um, and this particular uh, uh, measurement. Uh, in the Greek text is about 1,000 to 1,200 bushels. The yield of about 100 acres are worth about 2,500 denarii or $425. So uh, pretty, pretty rich man here. And, um, and of course, these are just uh, random samplings. In other words, he, there's, there's the implication here that there are others that he does this with, but you get, you get the idea. Take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. What is mammon? Yeah, money or wealth? Uh, there is some discussion in the commentators. Is it ill-gotten? Probably not. It's just the idea that the mammon wealth, the money of this world is unrighteous compared to the things that are truly important. And the reason I say that, that that's probably the definition is because we see it here in the context as we keep reading. Um, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, now notice the contrast here. The unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust what? The true riches, that is, spiritual things, eternal life. So, um, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I think we spent some time last week, we're not going to go into it again, um, you know, why this fellow is called the unrighteous or the unjust steward. He obviously wasted or squandered uh, his master's uh, property. And, of course, 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, 
if you're a steward, that is, you are a manager of another person's property, they've been given, they've given you control uh, to deal with it, take care of it, use it properly, and certainly for their gain. Kind of reminds me uh, of uh, Joseph uh, as he worked for Potiphar. Potiphar just turned it all over to him, except for his wife, and said, you know, you take care of it. And he prospered while Joseph was in charge. And so 1 Corinthians 4.2 says it is the responsibility of a steward to be what? Faithful, faithful, faithful in his responsibilities. This man was not. Now, the question, of course, is what he did with uh, reducing uh, the amount that was owed to these debtors, to, his, uh, uh, to, the, to the rich man, was that, was that unjust? Was that uh, wrong? Um, because people read this parable and they think, oh, they have a problem with it. Jesus is, con- is uh, commending uh, shady behavior. Well, no, that's, as we know when we study the parables, if, if that is shady behavior then um, that's not what Jesus is commending. Jesus, every parable has one central primary point that the Lord is trying to make. Now, there may be some others we can draw from it, but there's generally one primary point that we need to glean from the parable. And so, obviously, Jesus' point is not to commend uh, unrighteous or shady behavior in our business dealings. However, as I mentioned last week, not every commentator agrees that what this guy did was wrong. Uh, that in the economy of that day, you know, under Jewish law, uh, as I mentioned last week, they could not charge interest to fellow Jews. And so some of the rabbis held that if you had a contract that said, you know, I'm giving you this and you're going to pay me back this plus interest, that was an invalid contract. But let's say you owe me 80 and I put in there you're going to pay me uh, 80 plus 20 you know, dollars of interest. That's not a good contract. But if I, if I just wrote up a contract and said, you owe me 100 bucks, even though I only gave you 80, the rabbi said that was okay, <laughs> even though the interest factor is built into the total. As long as you just listed the total, then, then, then that was okay. So um, the point being is that what would happen on some occasions is you come along and all he did was, according to some commentators, was just knock off the usury, the interest. And by doing so, his Lord commended him because in the eyes of the community, that actually made him look good. You know, because look what he did for these people. I don't know if that's the case here or not. The bottom line is, whether what he did was shady or not, that's not the Lord's point. And certainly as a steward, he fell short because he had already squandered and wasted his master's goods. So, what do we draw from this parable? Um, It certainly warns us against what and encourages us to do what. Once you add on and you read it through the whole context through verse 13, And again, as we mentioned in here before, the Lord talks about two topics more than any other as far as what is written in the New Testament. I know he talked about a lot of things that's not recorded. But as far as what's recorded in the Gospel accounts, there are two topics that he discusses more than any other. Two topics that nobody wants any preacher to talk about. That's one of them. And hell. Jesus talked about hell and money more than any other subject. Uh, and uh, our attitude toward it, toward the physical possessions that we have. We understand that according to Psalm 24 that the earth is the Lord's, right? And the fullness thereof, and we have been charged with taking care of it, being good stewards because we don't bring anything into this world, according to Paul, and it certainly will carry nothing out. So it's not our stuff, but we're in charge of it while we're here, and one day we're going to have to give an account how we used it. So there's some warnings here against our love of money, our love of material wealth and possessions, and an emphasis on using what we have in preparation for what? Eternity. In other words, using what we have with an eye towards spiritual things rather than just either hoarding it or spending it on things we like. 
physical things, but using it, as we sometimes say, you can't take it with you, but you can do what? You can send it on ahead. There's a scripture out here on the wall that says, lay up, what? Treasures where? In heaven, right. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But it's interesting, the text here, um, this guy is something else. He says, um, what am I going to do? It's almost comical to me. Some commentators say in the Greek text, it's almost like he, uh, Jesus says, <laughs> this guy says, well, I can't work manually with my hands. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to beg. And then it's kind of like in the text, there's that, you know, when you're reading the comic strip, there's that light bulb that goes off above his head. And this guy shouts to himself, you know, Eureka, I've got it. Here's what I'm going to do. And Jesus commends this the activity on the part of this fellow as far as what? What did he do? What did he have? I mean, what was he thinking about? The future. He was thinking about the future. He's making preparation for the future. That's the point. That's, that's the commendation that's given him by his master is that he made preparation for his future. And it's interesting, uh, well, let's think about this for a minute. Um, look at that statement in verse 8. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. What's that mean? What does that mean? Absolutely, the people of this world, their hopes and their dreams and their purposes and their goals are centered on the material, right? And look how much effort they put into it. Um, I like what one commentator said, Trench, I think is his name, um, talking about the fact that the people of this world have more energy and foresight in their material concerns than we do as Christians in our practice of Christianity. This guy said that Christians, quote, bestow less pains to win heaven than the children of this world bestow to win earth. That they are less provident in heavenly things than those are in earthly. That the world is better served by its servants than God is by his. And that is certainly one of the chief points of this parable, that if we were as diligent and resourceful in kingdom business and spiritual business as people of this world are in the material you know, what could we do for the Lord what would we be doing for the Lord as, as individually and as a whole as far as our zeal I mean look how much time and effort I, I, I was reading one commentator and he gave some pretty good examples let's, let's think about professional athletes for instance or even at the collegiate level they're really professional athletes they're being paid to play. They get a free education. And uh, the ones you talk to will tell you that being in a Division I sport is like having a job. Um, and sometimes it's not all that enjoyable. But let's think about the amount of effort and, and uh, activity they put into what they do. How much training? When you think about a golfer, um, professional golfer, you know, I've listened to them talk about, you know, all the practice, all the different shots, all the different clubs, all the different angles. And they even practice at what angle, different angles it, and grips and all that kind of stuff. Look how much effort and time is put in just to play the game of golf. So, do we put that kind of effort into our Christianity? How much time do we spend in the Word of God each week? Yeah. Well, I'm not to the ninth verse yet. But we'll try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You know, think about all these computer hackers, ransomware and all that. How much time and energy do people put into getting into somebody else's computer and wreaking havoc on people's lives? You know, and the more that happens, the more I think these people really ought to be punished about like an armed robber or a murderer. They ought to get about 30 years for what they do. They wreak havoc on society. Yeah. Yeah, 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 watch your air conditioning unit, right? But you're right, I mean, even criminals put more time and effort, sadly to say, sometimes, than we as Christians put into our spiritual growth, our service, our worship. I mean, you know, we, how many times you beg people to show up here more than once a week, right? Yeah, Satan works hard. Um, so, um, but the point being then, we need to put that same kind of effort, if it's really that important to us. I mean, those are things that are important to those people. You know, golf's important to the golfer, right? Criminal activity, his plans are important to him, as well as our Christianity important to us. Is our worship and service to God and other people, is that important to us? Important enough to put that kind of effort into it. So he says, well, make friends for yourselves, the verse 9 you were asking about, by, by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Well, as I mentioned before, I believe the definition of unrighteous mammon is in verse 11. It's contrasted with the true riches. So I don't think what he's saying is um, these are ill-gotten gains but unrighteous in the sense that it is of this earth and it's worldly and it's material and it's not lasting. And so you compare that to the true riches. All he's saying here is use what you have. You use the material means that you have to accomplish things that will reap eternal benefits. That's what we need to be doing with our money or possessions. Use it for the benevolent purposes of saving other people, for instance. Or whatever the case might be. Because wealth is going to fail eventually. Um, you go, we've already looked at 1 Timothy 6 before and some other parables. But the fact of the matter is, the riches that are described in the New Testament, riches are always described, what's that term that we see in front of it? No, they're not filthy lucre. But riches are described as being what? As far as their uh, lasting effect. Yeah, uncertain, I think, is the term we usually see uh, about trusting in uncertain riches. It's not that it's wrong to be wealthy. But the problem is, is when we trust in money and in material things, we're, it's a misplaced trust because those things are uncertain. They're here today, gone tomorrow. You may lose them, like those people did in 1929, and then jump out a window you could lose them while you're still alive but you're certainly going to lose them when when you die or when the Lord comes back because we're not going to be living in a material world as Madonna would say so you're not going to be a material girl in a material world right um, so we can't allow money to be our master we can't be its slave. It has to work for us. We want it to work for us in an eternal way, right? Um, and, of course, again, the parable also reminds us from very, very basically that it's not ours anyway, right? It, it's, just been, it's just been given to us to manage, and so one day we're going to be called in just like this fellow was, and he's going to say, hey, give an account. What would you do with you know, the material possessions and the money and the opportunities and the health and all that that I gave you to manage while you were here, what'd you do with it? And, and sadly to say, the vast majority of people squander, like this fellow, waste the things that God has given us. 
And so it's got to be used in his service because literally, I mean, we're not, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that everything we have belongs to him. Anything we have, including our spirit, came from him. So, again, our responsibility is to be found faithful. And, of course, there's going to be a final audit, an accounting, right? And so that awaits everybody. And uh, we've got to be ready for it. That's why we call this a... Um, preparedness parable being ready for that final audit or that final accounting any questions or comments Yeah, when you, when you compare our society with the rest of the world, we, we really li live in an unrealistic situation. Um, I, I noticed, I mean, again, you know, you hear on the news, Trump's budget's going to hurt the poor. We don't have any poor in this country, really. What we have is a government that arbitrarily says if you don't make $40,000 a year and have this number of people in your house, you're poor. Even though you have a cell phone and two computers and three TVs and a car, and heating and air and all that, you're poor. Uh, that's not being poor. According to the Bible, being poor is no clothes, no shelter, and no food. So if you want to see somebody poor, go to some other continent and look at those pictures, and you can see somebody that's really poor. What, we're mean, what we mean here is in our ever-increasing socialistic society is that you have more than me, and that's not fair, and because you have more than me, I'm going to have the government legally steal it from you and redistribute it to me because it's not fair that you have more than me. That's what we mean by poor in our country. Uh, it's a socialistic concept. All right, enough of that on Memorial Day. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 25. And we'll see in the time we have left if we can cover the ten virgins. Now... Um, as you know, Matthew 24, of course, is that great Olivet Discourse when Jesus um, first talks about the destruction of Jerusalem through about um, verse 34. And then in beginning in verse 35, he talks about his actual second return, second coming. Uh, and it's in that context then that we have three parables in Matthew 25 um, that deal with that. And uh, we've already looked at the parable of the talents there in verse 14 of 25. We'll probably look at verses 31 and the end of the, to the end of the chapter uh, this fall. But the parable of the wise and foolish virgins begins in verse 1 of chapter 25. Again, talking about preparedness, being ready. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And then we hear this sad statement, And the door was shut, shut such that it could not be opened. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I do not know you. Who is Jesus talking to in this discourse from, Olive, from the Mount of Olives? Who's, he to, who's in his audience? I'm more specific than that. 
his disciples. He's not just talking to the, the crowds. He's talking to his own disciples. So he's talking to us. And it's interesting to me this statement that he uses here. Go back to Matthew chapter 7, and for those that say, uh, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Did I not do that? And then he will say, the Lord will say what? Depart from me. Now notice the difference in these two phrases. To people who never obey the gospel, to people who are not his disciples, to people who are not his children, the Lord says, I Never knew you. Right? In this context, he's talking to his disciples, his followers, who were not prepared to meet him when he comes again, and he says what? I don't know you. He didn't say, I never knew you. And that's a big difference in semantics, because what it tells me is, is that even though I'm a Christian, and even though... I'm a disciple, and even though I've obeyed the gospel, if I do like these five foolish virgins, and I'm not prepared for his return, then I can be lost, contrary to what the denominational world thinks. Yeah. Yeah. And really, when we... And as I mentioned when we started our study, you know, as we classified these parables, a lot of them can be classified in more than one way. We're, we're calling this a preparedness parable because of the context, but really the way it starts out, we could have classified it as a kingdom parable, right? When we looked at all those kingdom parables, the sower and or the soils and all that. So... You're right. It tells you in verse 1 then he's talking to his own people. So for people that never obeyed and that were never his followers, depart, I never knew you. For those of you that did obey me and you weren't prepared, you didn't stay sharp and do what you were supposed to do and you weren't ready for my return, I don't know you. I knew you at one time, but I don't know you now. Well, I don't know that we have time. We'll talk a little bit. Um, there's a lot of discussion in different commentators, and I looked at more than one, about these uh, first century marriage customs. <laughs> um, as you know from just your reading of Joseph and Mary, um, you know, if you were betrothed, that was something much more serious than what we call an engagement. Because actually, if you were betrothed, you were husband and wife. You just didn't live together and consummate the marriage until some month, maybe a year or two, whatever, later when they had the formal wedding ceremony. But you were already married. And so, um, you know, for Mary to be found pregnant, betrothed to Joseph, that was serious. And yet Joseph, being the man he was, was going to try to put her away without a lot of fuss. She was in a lot of trouble. And so, um, because frankly, I mean, girls at that time were married off much younger uh, than they are now. I mean, you know, once they were in their mid-teens, it was time to be betrothed. And so, you now come to the ceremony and um, and so it's very possible, and I've seen two renderings of this, but it's very possible that the custom was that, you know, the bride was taken along with her, uh, uh, the virgins that accompanied her, her wedding party. They took her to the groom's house, um, and there waited on him to arrive and to take up his residence, uh, their residence as actual husband and wife, uh, and begin uh, living together uh, as part of the ceremony. Of course, there was a big celebration. But if you weren't there and in the celebration on time, you got left out. The door was shut. And so um, then, of course, um, we don't know why he was delayed. You get all kinds of speculations when you study this stuff. You know, one guy was speculating that, hey, you know, the last thing that had to be taken care of was the... Um, negotiation over the dowry. And that could be pretty contentious and take a while. 
you know, while the bridegroom was, was uh, negotiating with the father as to how much, you know, the dowry was going to be. And so maybe he was delayed for that. You know, they're arguing over money. Well, I don't know. But for whatever reason, he's delayed. Now notice, how many of them went to sleep? They all did. They all did. So the fact that they went to sleep is not the point. There's nothing wrong with going to sleep. In fact, more, most likely, this sleep is the sleep of death. They went to sleep. And as they awoke, the bridegroom was delayed. Christ, How long has it been since Christ was here? A couple thousand years, right? So as he's delayed, people go to sleep. And the way they go to sleep, if they're prepared or not, that's it, right? When they awaken to the sound of the bridegroom, they're either prepared or they're not. And so these virgins awoke, and, they, and I see, and again, I've seen all kinds of explanations of what kind of lamps these were, and I don't know, you know, you get the, you got the little kind, they said, and then one commentator said, no, it was the big torch kind. But either way, they just used the rags and they poured the oil on the rags for the torches. Others said, no, it was actually the little oil-burning lamps. But either way it went, you know, the oil on there was only going to last about 15 minutes or whatever it was, and then you got to put a little more in there. In other words, if you're going to be there very long at all, you know you got to have some extra oil, right? Um, and so they're there longer than they expected. Uh, and he, of course, returns at an unexpected time. And um, there was no more opportunity for preparation after he came. Uh, so, lesson number one, we cannot neglect to be ready. Right? You can't neglect the preparation. You can't put it off and say, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, um, and look, let's, let's, let's think about this. It didn't mean that these virgins lived their lives gazing up at the sky. You ever heard of people that go out, you know, they just know when Christ is coming back? You know, they got some prophet that says he's coming back on July 12th of this year, and so they run off to the hills of Arkansas and stock up on a few supplies, and they're just sitting there waiting. You can't live life like that. That's not what it means to be prepared. Um, life goes on and we have responsibilities but there's certainly some prior precautions and preparations that need to be made um, even as we go about our daily affairs and so we have to be prepared um, I mean aren't there things in life that you just can't put off to the last minute to get ready for what if you're going to run a half marathon or a marathon. You're going to get up. Is any, Are most of you in here just going to get up next week and say, I think I'll go run a marathon? Is that the way it works? No. It doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of training to get ready for something like that. Um, what about when you take a trip? How many of you um, are going to um, leave this afternoon and, and go down to New Orleans and get on a boat and take a cruise and you haven't packed yet? Any people like that? Hadn't packed, hadn't done anything. Well, my boat leaves at such and such time, I'll just throw it all together here right 10 minutes before I go. I know there's some people that try to do that. But it usually doesn't work out so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. You can't borrow righteousness, and you can't borrow preparedness, and you can't borrow salvation from anybody else. You can only prepare for yourself. And you've got all kinds of Mormons and others that talk about baptism for the dead, and, and uh, Catholics have purgatory, and there uh, used to be a time when they would actually collect, you know, remember indulgences. You could buy people out of it. doesn't work that way. You are either prepared at the time of your death or you're not, and you can't get it from somebody else. 
And you can't borrow character from somebody else. You can't borrow righteousness and holiness and all those good things that God expects of his people. You don't get that from somebody. It doesn't matter how good your parents are. You know, or how faithful they were. Or some other family member. It doesn't transfer like that. And so, getting back to this preparation idea, I was talking about taking a trip. These people were going to be taking a trip. What about exams? Is it, is it a good thing just to scoot along in the semester and wait till the night before the final exam and say, hey, I think I'll open the book tonight. Is that a good idea? But these, these, these virgins were getting ready to undergo their final exam. Yeah. You had something? <laughs> yeah although I am starting to think in our society brother Rufus that we need to go back to the draft because nobody's getting any discipline at home so let's put them for two years in the military at least get something huh yeah yeah but he's right eventually anything of real importance in our character and that's why, you know, Christianity is a religion of, of the heart and of the mind. It's, it's in here. You don't change people by passing laws. You don't change people by chopping off their heads or blowing them up or whatever the case might be. Or you might get them to fake their way through some religion. But you really only change people from the inside, and that's what Christianity is about. Not, you know, you don't threaten people. Uh, and that kind of thing, with bodily harm to get them to convert. Because God expects personal submission, and he expects it, you know, we're all personally accountable, right? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Romans 14.12, so each of us shall give account of himself to God, and nobody else, and nobody can give an account for us. Another point here is, of course, we cannot recall lost opportunities. Can't get those back. How many uh, opportunities, how many chances did these virgins have to be ready? Yeah, but really, how, how many chances did they get to be ready? They're going to this wedding. They either take, yeah, they either take their oil or they don't. They had one chance, one opportunity to be ready. Take your extra oil or don't take your extra oil. They left it behind. They didn't get another opportunity to do it right. And that's the way life is. You don't get it. You know, none of us are being incarnated. I'm not coming back as uh, Brad Pitt or something. <laughs> Sometimes people confuse me, with, but, but I'm not coming back that way. <clears throat> but every day he's got opportunities, right? Every day he's got opportunities, and, and we, we need to not neglect those opportunities. Uh, we've got opportunities to do good, opportunities to do bad. And, you know, most of the time, I mean, let's think about it here. Um, most of the time, it's not a matter of people doing something bad. It's not a matter of Christians doing something bad. It's just a matter of that we're not doing anything at all. Right? We're just not doing anything at all. We've talked about this over and over again, and I've got some more parables I want to cover. But a lot of these parables that Jesus teaches, they're not dealing with necessarily bad people, but it's the fact that too many times we rely upon negative righteousness rather than a positive righteousness. That is, we believe we're good and we're all right in the sight of God and we're going to be saved because of things that we do not do well all that's important don't do those things keep not doing those things but Christianity is more than not doing these things Christianity also involves doing those things over here it, it is a positive yeah not leaving them undone you shouldn't have left off uh, those things, but you left out the weightier matters of the law, right? You know, you didn't, you didn't serve other people, you didn't help other people, 
you didn't teach other people. There's a lot of things you didn't do. I understand that you didn't do these bad things, but you didn't do the things I wanted you to be busy doing. That is, making a difference in the world around you. And so, every day we get confronted with those kinds of opportunities. And so the question is, you know, what are we doing with them? And then there comes a point where there's no more opportunity. You know, you're either prepared or you're not. Now that door was shut, but these doors have now been opened means class is about over so we'll end there with the parable of the uh, wise and foolish virgins and we may do some more in the fall who knows